I started with Houston Audubon um, as a board member in the early 1980s. I don't remember which exactly which year. I think it was 1983. Um, I have always been interested in birds, and I, you know, the first part of my life, I, it, you know, I don't know. There's a there's a line in Ecclesiastes, I believe it is, that whatever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. Well, that's me. <laughs> so, you know, I was interested in birds at a young age, and I just went full bore. Read every book. That's the kind of guy I am. When I'm interested in something, I start doing research. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a professor. I'm a scholar. I, you know, I started really getting into the identification of birds and their sounds, their songs, their voices, and really got involved in that. Um, and I went to an Audubon meeting, I think in the early 19... No, it was kind of the late, latter 1970s. And, um, and they met in a small room in the basement of the uh, Museum of Natural Sciences. And it was a small group of people, but golly, I was so impressed with their dedication, with their enthusiasm about conservation of birds, which was something I didn't think that many bird watchers were paying attention to at that time. I had read an article, a scholarly article, I believe it was from a scientist at Cornell, about the decline in birds, and he had written, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember which particular article it was, but he had written this article and he said that we would lose somewhere between 30% and 60% of our birds um, by the end of the century, meaning the end of the 20th century. Well, man, that got my attention. <laughs> that really alarmed me. And I certainly, through my lifetime, had noticed a decline in bird life, but I had no idea. Somebody had documented it to be that severe. So I began to be really interested in conservation of birds. And I went to the Audubon meeting, and uh, I, I, I was just, I thought they were delightful people. <laughs> they really cared, and they were really pursuing avenues to protect habitat. Uh, avenues to protect birds, and I thought that was great. The person who spoke at that meeting, by the way, was John Tweeton. Um, I didn't know him at that moment. Uh, he gave a great program. I uh, later got to know him. He became a very close friend and a mentor, by the way, for both me and my wife, Kathy Adams Clark. Um, so anyway, I I, you know, I live up in the North Country, <laughs> you know, in, the, in the Woodlands area, and I didn't think that, at the time I didn't think that I would get involved with Houston Audubon because they were down here in Houston. <laughs> you know, at that point in, in the history of the world, uh, you know, where I live, was way far from Houston. Now, of course, it's all blended into one thing. I know I'm going on and on about this, I'm sorry, but I just want to give you a little background. Um, so at the time, I, I didn't really think that there was much need for me to get directly involved in Audubon, although I certainly joined it and paid my dues, I even went on some of their field trips. Um, and also I participated in, in what they were calling, that what they had is the bird of thon in those days, who still have it, I know. And uh, my friend, uh, Mike Austin, Dr. Mike Austin, still my very dear friend, and I decided we would participate in the birdathon. And, uh, you know, we were both hotshot birders. <laughs> I mean, you know, did a birds by sight and by sound like that. All the older I get, the, you know, uh, my hearing is not as good. But anyway, we uh, did one of those birdathons and we won. And that's really how I got to know Fred Collins um, at the ceremony where we won the uh, trophy at that time. And I was just, 
you know, okay, great. I can identify a bunch of birds and I can go out and I can, you know, see more birds than maybe somebody else. You know, big deal. But how am I going to help protect them? That was my concern. So anyway, I went back and um, I started, or help start, I talked to some people and I, and I got this organization started called the Piney Woods Wildlife Society to serve the group of people up where I live and to get them involved in birding. You know, the, on, the way you get people concerned and interested in conservation is first you introduce them to, the, to nature to whatever it is they're interested in. And most people are interested in birds, at least. Now, from birds, they might get into other things, which is great, you know. John introduced me to butterflies. I always thought butterflies were bird food. <laughs> but John turned my head around about that. Anyway, um, I'm rambling on, I apologize. At any rate, uh, I helped start the Piney Woods Wildlife Society and was its first president. And uh, the way people got the message out about rare birds in Texas was through a phone tree. And I believe the Ornithology Group of Texas started that. I mean, in, uh, Ornithology Group of Houston had started that. So they had a phone tree, and I was on the phone tree. And, uh, you know, being a I don't know, young, I don't know, aggressive kind of guy, visionary kind of guy, looking at the future, I thought, yeah, this, you know, we can do a better job than this. We can have a recorded message, <clears throat> and anybody can call into a recorded message. They don't have to have a phone tree. You know, I'll call, I'll call uh, Jim Wynn, and he'll call somebody else about this rare bird. By that time, the bird's gone. So why not pick up your phone and call into a recording? <clears throat> now you have to understand recordings in those days, this big box, huge box. <laughs> but I kept that in my office at the college with the permission of the uh, then college uh, dean and president. Kept that in the office in the college and I updated it and, uh, uh, all the time. So when a rare bird showed up, <clears throat> then it was called into that tape machine um, and then I would, I, then I would record a message in that tape machine about a rare bird, where it was, and why it was important. And that got the attention of Ted Eubanks, <laughs> and he was a big help in participating in calling in rare birds. And, and then you know, Piney Woods Wildlife Society was going great guns. We started the turtle project, the uh, Ridley Turtle Project, and the Rescue Ridley Turtle. Um, we were involved in that, and we were involved in a number of other things. <clears throat> and Ted called, and he said, um, I'd really like you to be a member of the Houston Audubon Board. And I thought, boy, that's great. Thank you, Ted. Sure. <laughs> I'm pretty enthusiastic about what you all are doing. Um, and he said, well, we're enthusiastic about what Piney Woods is doing. So we kind of had a little bit of a marriage between the Piney Woods Wildlife Society at that time and uh, Houston Audubon. And I, it worked out pretty well. And then I was on the board during the 1980s when we were pursuing some extraordinarily important work, namely the purchase of property at High Island. Um, and that was an aggressive move on the board's part. Conserving habitat. The way you can serve birds is to conserve their habitat. And I was thrilled because we at Piney Woods <coughs> had um, also been involved in conserving habitat up in our part of the country, <clears throat> as well as, by the way, the Piney Woods Wildlife Society conserved habitat in Costa Rica. So that was right up my alley. You know, I mean, this is what I was looking for. People who were interested in protecting birds by protecting the places where they live and needed to live, or the way stations that migratory birds needed, meaning High Island. We were really, really engaged in that during my uh, 
um, membership on the board. That was our focus. And I was very <clears throat> proud and, uh, and uh, happy to be part of that endeavor. Uh, plus a number of other things. Of course, we were advocates um, for you know, some other things. So we were battling uh, a number of agencies, <laughs> one of which was the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so anyhow, long story, so let me just kind of go through that. We worked really hard. We did acquire property and, um, and we, we also began to work on the Bolivar Flats Shorebird Sanctuary and that was spearheaded by Stinney Metters who agreed to stay on the board when, when I became president. By the way, I did not lobby to be president. <laughs> I wasn't trying to be president. Dad was doing a great job. Fred Collins before him did a great job. So I thought there were a number of people on the board who could you know, be president. But uh, certain members of the board wanted me to be president. And, and uh, I said, well, okay. And you know, the board at that time, they, they had a membership for the, uh, they had a meeting in, Mar in, in May in which they elected board members. And uh, May, after the semester ended in May, then I had a little vacation. So I took off and I went down to South Texas, Rio Grande Valley. <laughs> well, if I'm gone, they won't elect me because <laughs> I won't be at the uh, annual meeting. Um, you know, those days there were cell phones, couldn't call anybody. Um, and I stayed at Falcon Dam State Park which was really remote anyway, camped out there in the days when you could do that. Um, then I came back home and, you know, learned that I was you now president-elect of Ottawa. <laughs> and I, again, you know, I, I always follow the, that, uh, I mean, it's just, it's not, I don't know how to put this, it, it's just in me, and I don't know why it's in me, but whatever is in my lap, it becomes my passion. Um, whatever my hand finds to do, I do it, and I, and I do it hard. I work hard at it, and I've done that way. I've been that way all my life. Um, I'm not saying that as bragging. Please don't misunderstand. I'm just saying that some, some, that there's something in my brain that makes me, that. Uh, and I, and I have no idea why that is, but that's why I know. So I certainly threw myself wholeheartedly into it, and then when it became my turn to be president, then I threw my whole heart into that. When I, both as a board member and president-elect, and then later president, it, it was clear to me that what kept Audubon going were its volunteers. Without the volunteers, there would not be an Audubon. And I did everything I could to encourage them, both when I was a board member and then later as president, and to assure them that they had my backing. And, and there were times when they needed help, and, and sometimes when they needed funding, and it was my job to give them all the help they needed, because without those volunteers, those dedicated volunteers, at the uh, Elm, Seat at the Elmore Nature Sanctuary. And we certainly needed volunteers at High Island when we were acquiring property. And without, without people volunteering their time, you know, they weren't getting recognition for that. Um, they were doing it out of the just love of birds. And, and by the way, board members are volunteers too. We were all volunteers too. So don't... I understood that everybody on my board was a volunteer, um, and you know, Audubon, the gears of Audubon are volunteers. <laughs> it's not the person who's the president. Uh, it's it's the people who have volunteered their time, including board members, and it's a commitment. And I was so impressed from the my first. Remember the first meeting I had with Audubon and 
I mean that I went to the first meeting I went to at Audubon and down in the basement of the Museum of Natural Science when there were maybe 12 people. I, they were all volunteers and they were dedicated and man, I, I loved that. Uh, I'm into that kind of thing. And ever since then I have admired and respected and supported the volunteers. When I became president, I certainly did. So here was the thing. I became president. We had committed ourselves and signed, and I had signed. <laughs> My life away. I had signed the papers to buy properties at High Island. Um, so we had made a big commitment and when I got to be president I was looking at the books. Now, you know, my job is a professor of business. And I took a look at the books and I said, my God, we're broke. We're absolutely broke. We have no money. Uh, we've got all these bills. And the other thing I discovered was that we were we were in arrears of taxes, um, you know, school taxes, and then, I mean big time arrears. Wow, <laughs> we had to do something about this. So, uh, you know, I had to choose my board members or ask people to serve on my board, and certainly some of the board members that are, were on um, the previous board, I wanted them to stay on. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But, I certainly wanted Stinney Matters, and she agreed, thank goodness. Bless her heart, she's so great. Um, but I needed somebody to help me with finance. And uh, I knew somebody that was really good at that. I mean, fabulous at that. And he was the chief financial officer of my college. And I had watched him operate, and I knew him. And, you know, colleges have financial issues too, and he was just genius at that sort of stuff and I went to him, his name was Jeff Marcy, and I went to Jeff and said, I want you to be on the Houston Audubon board. You will? He looked at me and said, Gary, I don't know, I don't know anything about birds. And I said, you don't have to know anything about birds. All you have to do is care. <laughs> and he said, well, I really do care. When I was in California, I was a member of the Sierra Club, so I really do care about the environment, but I don't know anything about birds and you know, Audubon, you Audubon people are bird people. And I said, Jeff, yes, but we're conservationists. We like Sierra Club, just, just as Sierra Club, we care about conservation. And, um, you know, we're not just a bunch of people who go out with binoculars and watch birds. We, we're trying to conserve habitat, but we need, I need you to help me with the finances, because the finances of Houston Audubon are not in good shape. And he thought about it, and he said, well, yeah, sure, I'll do that, thank goodness. <laughs> so Jeff came in, and I remember the first meeting after he looked at the books, he came to the board meeting, and he said, y'all are broke. <laughs> and, he, and I said, Jeff, remember, you're a board member. <laughs> he said, correction, <laughs> we're broke. Now, you know, when you're a board member at Audubon, you have a fiduciary responsibility. It wasn't Audubon was broke, that means we board members were financially liable for the debts, uh, especially the taxes. So my job was to get that straightened out and I worked with Jeff to uh, help us get the taxes worked out. I think we had some of the taxes forgiven but we still needed to pay a lot of money. And how do you get the money? Well, it was clear to me that some of the donors at Audubon had kind of fallen by the wayside, the big donors of Audubon, uh, and I don't know why, and that's, that's a long story, so I don't want to get into that. But I started calling these large donors and having uh, lunches with them at Edith Elmore Sanctuary, and then one of the donors, and, and I'm, I'm not going to mention names, and one of the donors wanted to meet with me at a, uh, at a uh, exclusive country club, and that was fine. Uh, and I talked to these donors, and I said, we need help. You know what we're doing. You supported us once. Please support us again. I, I wanted to make a personal connection with them. 
Um, we're not mean people, you know, we're not out to kill people, <laughs> we're not out to have a fight, we're out to save the birds. And, um, and thank goodness they agreed and they started donating money. And, uh, and then the second prong of, of getting money, of course, was to get membership. Uh, get membership, membership dues, and, and then members donating money. So we built up membership. We began to build up membership. We began to restore our relationship with donors and get donors to help us out, and they did. And eventually, within about a year, we were reasonably financially stable. So the first major problem I had was a problem of finance. A problem of getting money. So the two prongs, first going to our, our donors and talking to them and getting donations and, and then building up membership, which we did. Um, and then, you know, uh, going to the oil companies, talking to oil companies. Now, I, I started my life, my career, not in, in education, not in um, being a professor, but I, as a young man getting out of college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And by the way, everything I've ever done in my life, I've just stumbled into it. <laughs> it's found me. I haven't found it. But I, you know, I had, I needed a job and I was searching around, I had a search firm and they said, well, how about advertising? I didn't know anything in the world about advertising, the world of advertising. But anyhow, somehow or another, I landed a job with, uh, a major advertising agency, McCann Erickson, and they uh, do the advertising for Exxon, at the time Exxon, um, and, and then also uh, some other large companies like Coca-Cola. <laughs> and I wound up working for that company, uh, doing market research, and then later actually writing uh, advertising. Uh, working on commercials. So I learned a lot about the importance of publicity, the importance of visibility. Uh, you know, we said in advertising, the thing that you want is visibility. Uh, it's not so much important what the commercial says. It's important that the product or service or company that we're advertising is right in front of somebody's face, you know, it's there. Uh, it's top of mind awareness. That's what we were doing. There, there's a research, market research activity called measuring top of mind. It's, if I say birds, what comes to the top of your mind? Well, it seemed to me when I was president of Audubon that top of mind was not, was Audubon. I mean, people would say Audubon. But they didn't necessarily connect it to the local Houston chapter of Audubon. Um, and they didn't really know what Audubon was doing. And of course, the, the reason it was top of mind was not because the Audubon Society, it was because of John James Audubon uh, and all the publicity that surrounded him. So, uh, you know, I, I went from advertising into education and became a, a full professor, of course. Uh, but anyhow, I never forgot what I learned in my brief tenure in the world of advertising, how important it was to get publicity, how important it was to get the media to pay attention to you. And I knew how to do that. So uh, I, you know, I, 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 let me backtrack a moment, if I may. I went to the our big donors. I helped, we worked, and when I say I, we, the board, we worked on recruiting members. And uh, I obviously knew some people at Exxon from my days of advertising, and I had some talks with them. <laughs> and they weren't too keen on working with Audubon, because <laughs> National Audubon, in their magazine, they were always lambasting the oil companies. And I 
said, you know, we're not, we're, yes, we are part of National Audubon, but we're not National Audubon. We're a separate organization and we're not at war with you. Um, you're on, we're on the same page. You know that you want to conserve habitat and we do too, but we need your help. And so I tried to establish good relations with uh, Exxon in particular and we got some really good money to help purchase land, more property at, at uh, High Island and pay for it. And then, of course, I went to um, to this guy at Conoco, who was I talking about? Uh, Steve, uh, Steve, yeah, Steve. <laughs> Steve was a good friend, um, and I had birded with him. I knew him pretty well. And I went to Steve's office. I said, Steve, can I come to your office and talk to you? He said, sure. So I went to talk to him, and I said, I want you to be on my board at Audubon. And he said, Gary, I can't do that. I'm an oil man. You know, at that time it was Phillips, um, Phillips Petroleum Company. And he said, I'm an oil man. And he was a you know, relatively high-level executive at, at uh, Phillips. And, and he was a dedicated birder. I knew that because I birded with him, knew him well. Good guy. And I understood his pain and his agony, and I said, but Steve, we're not against the oil company. Uh, we're not anti-oil. <laughs> and you can even help Phillips by being part of Audubon. That is, you can see, you can show that, you know, Houston Audubon's not at war with the oil business. Uh, and oil business is fundamental to Houston's life. And he, you know, so I had to twist his arm some more and convince him, but he, he joined our board and he worked really hard. And, you know, my idea with board members at that time was, I am, yeah, just turn them loose. Uh, let them do what they need to do, what they want to do. And it was Steve's idea to work with this organization that was gradually becoming real called the Gulf Coast Bird Observatory, but they didn't have any funding. They they really were kind of at loose ends about what to do. And I just, you know, Steve was really interested in farming Gulf Coast Bird Observatories. Go for it. I mean, it's a great idea. And he was also interested, as, as we all were, in the Katy Prairie Conservancy. So, you know, the idea was to turn people loose on the things they were interested in. And, and you know, the rest is history. Look at uh, GCBO and look at the Katy Prairie Conservancy. And I'm proud to say that uh, our board was instrumental in getting those organizations going. And, and then you know, later, many of my board members became board members, including Steve Gast of, of um, GCBO and the Katy Prairie Conservancy. As did I. I was a board member, later a board member <clears throat> and um, vice president of GCBO. But we all were helping out other organizations that were involved in the same thing we were. That is, we never saw ourselves as competitors. We're all in this together. And we work with any group that wanted to do the same thing we wanted to do, which was conserve habitat for birds. I mean, that's what we wanted to do. Birds need habitat. Um, and we really began um, an aggressive approach to, to, to purchasing land habitat along the Gulf Coast, especially High Island, as we all now know, <clears throat> and sealing the deal. Uh, and as well as Bonner Flats Shorebird Sanctuary, which Danny Meadows was heading into an incredible job of working uh, with the state uh, general land office <clears throat> to allow us a hundred year lease on that property. And we then, of course, acquired what is now what Horseshoe Marsh um, across the highway. 
Uh, and that's expanded. I mean, as you know, I, you on the board know better than I do how much that has expanded since the uh, <clears throat> early 1990s when I left the Houston Audubon board. Audubon needed visibility, uh, high visibility in the community. And, uh, and then that's, I mentioned that a little earlier, so I apologize. I, I went off on a tear about getting the oil companies involved, or getting uh, money from the oil companies and getting Steve Gast involved. But let me go back to that visibility thing, because that was important. I needed to be at anything involved, <clears throat> any meeting that was involved with um, the Harris County Flood Control District, uh, any meeting that was <clears throat> held by the Army Corps of Engineers. And I made it a point to be at those meetings, and I spoke up. Well, when you start speaking up at those kind of meetings, you get people's attention. <laughs> and you also get the attention of the news media, the local news media, so television especially. And I was glad to do that, and always, this on behalf of Audubon. Uh, we were opposed, very much opposed, to some of the things that the Harris County Flood Control District wanted to do. One of the things they wanted to do was channelize that uh, Runnels Creek that goes through Edith Elmore Nature Sanctuary over my dead body. I, mean, I told them that straight to their face, you'll do that over my dead body. Um, and, you know, that, that didn't happen, as you know. But in, in being really kind of, I don't want to say nasty, but aggressive and opposing some of these harebrained ideas that came up and doing it rather publicly, got the attention of the news media. Uh, on behalf of Audubon, as always, Audubon does this, not me. Audubon uh, disagrees with this. <clears throat> we challenged the Army Corps of Engineers on a number of issues and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, we were able to work out arrangements with them um, with a lot of help. Um, didn't do it by ourselves. We had a lot of legal help. And um, so, but the point, my point was that we had to get Audubon in the forefront of people's minds, Houston Audubon, in the forefront of people's minds when it came to helping birds. And we had to do that with television, visibility. We had to be on the news. And that got the attention of National Public Radio. And I don't, actually I don't remember what instigated that, but I did, I think, three interviews with NPR about some of the things that we were doing locally. That, conservation of habitat at High Island, but also we were still involved with the uh, Ridley Turtle Rescue. And at that time, some of the uh, <clears throat> reporters at NPR were, how shall I say this, they were kind of nasty. <laughs> I mean, they were, they were, they were kind of smart-alecky. And they would ask smart-alecky kind of questions. Well, okay, you want to ask smart alecky questions, I can give you a smart aleck answer. And when I was interviewed about the Ridley turtles, I was like, well, what are you going to do? You can't help the turtles, you know? Why are you so involved in this? I said, well, what do you want me to do? You want me to strap myself on the back of a Ridley sea turtle and go out to sea with it and help it? <laughs> this was when we were lobbying, by the way, for the turtle exclusion device on shrimp boats. And the uh, person who was interviewing me on NPR was, he just didn't understand why that was so important. And so I can be snarky if I have to be. I don't, I'm not normally that way, but <clears throat> I certainly could be. But the point, my whole idea, it wasn't about me. It was about making sure that <clears throat> Audubon was noticed, was visible by local news media. <clears throat> and it just fell into our lap that we got noticed by national news media. So <clears throat> take advantage of that. I learned that lesson in my young years, my very young years in the advertising business. Uh, what was the old saying? 
any publicity is good publicity. <laughs> uh, you don't care how you spell my name as long as you know my name. Um, kind of thing. And I and it worked. I mean, it, I think it worked because we got lots more people in Houston interested in Audubon, interested in joining Audubon, and interested in membership in Audubon. And uh, that kind of publicity worked. And, uh, and then getting really involved in challenging some of the um, local agencies, you know, Harris County Flood Control, especially Army Corps of Engineers. We also negotiated um, with the Army Corps of Engineers to maintain um, Clear Creek as a freshwater stream. And that was working with Friendswood Development Corporation at the time, which was a subsidiary at the time of Exxon. And, and actually that, that was not a terribly hard negotiation, but it did take some, you know, talking. <laughs> uh, we had to do some, uh, you know, no, I wouldn't say threats, but we had to say, look, we got to maintain at least a clear water stream in this area. And, and we did, and to my knowledge, it still is a clear water stream. So we, we made some accomplishments, and another accomplishment that we, we made a number of accomplishments, other than the very, the most important accomplishment of acquiring property along the Gulf Coast, especially at High Island, and expanding those properties. <clears throat> and and again, let me say, these were volunteers that were helping with that, doing that. They were doing the the hard work. <clears throat> but another issue arose in which TxDOT, good old TxDOT, wanted to run a highway through Jones State Forest. Jones State Forest being the southernmost uh, limit of the red cockade, the endangered red cockaded woodpecker. Historically, the red cockaded woodpecker was down here in Houston, but <clears throat> um, Again, loss of habitat caused it to retreat and it became an endangered species. But it didn't go any farther south than FM 1488, Jones State Forest. Well, TxDOT was going to build a major highway right through. They were going to expand 1488 and build a major highway right through um, Jones Forest. You know, again, over my dead body. <laughs> so uh, I had to talk with people at the Woodlands Development Corporation. They were in favor of running that highway southward, looping it through the woodlands, so that it would help, obviously, the development of Woodlands North, the Woodlands North. That highway, of course, became Highway 242. But at the time, TxDOT said, "No, we're gonna we're gonna run it straight. It's, it's cheaper. It's less expensive for us to run it straight through 1488." <clears throat> the idea was to run the highway. <clears throat> excuse me, run a major highway through to U.S. Highway 59. And we arranged a meeting with um, TxDOT at the headquarters for the Women's Development Corporation. And I, you know, I'm always, my knee-jerk reaction is never, I'm going to sue you. That is never my knee-jerk reaction. My knee-jerk reaction is what do we have in common, what can we talk about, what can we negotiate, and almost everything that we accomplished was accomplished through negotiations as opposed to having to threaten lawsuits. Now, a couple of times we did have to threaten lawsuits. But <clears throat> that was never my knee-jerk reaction. So we were sitting at the conference table and I and I'm trying to talk to TxDOT, trying to talk sense into TxDOT. <laughs> Come on, think about this. You're going through the vital habitat of an endangered species, uh, 
we just can't let you do that. We just can't. Come on. We're this development corporation that said you can run it through, you know, south through us. And Tech Thought, you know, boy, they had their, they were sticking to their uh, routine. They want to do what they want to do. And so I leaned over the table and I looked directly at it and I said, if you run that highway through the endangered species of the red cockaded woodpecker through Jones State Forest, if you do that, Houston Audubon will sue you. I assure you of that. I backed off and said, okay, we'll, we'll talk later. The next day I got a phone call from them. Uh, we decided, we worked with uh, the Woodlands Development Corporation, we're going to run it through the, the Woodlands. We're going to run it behind <laughs> the state forest. So well, that's good. <laughs> it was a win-win. Uh, really, because it helped Woodlands Development Corporation and it saved the you know, Red Cockade Woodpecker's habitat. And now you know it as Highway 242, and it still connect, and it connects with U.S. Highway 59. So it was a win, I think, for for everybody. Well, I'm you know I'm Houston Audubon's doing great. I'm, obviously keeping in touch with what the board's doing and yeah, my full support. Um, I, you don't, you don't need any recommendations from me. You're doing fine. I just keep doing it. And, and uh, never forget, you are a volunteer. What you're doing is a volunteer job and you work with volunteers and without those volunteers, the gears of Houston Audubon wouldn't function. So. Um, that's that's not advice. I, I, I'm I'm not I'm too old to give advice, so it's 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 not my advice to you. It's just that's the way things work. We, the Houston Audubon Society, exist because people believe in us. They believe in what we do, um, and we have to remind them constantly, by the way, of what we're doing. We need to keep up that visibility, that presence of mind. An you know, old advertising term is called presence of mind. Uh, given, you know, ten detergent products, what's, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? It's called presence of mind. And for Thai detergent, they wanted presence of mind. That is, they wanted that to be one of the first products that came up. Exxon gasoline, they wanted that product to be presence of mind. First thing that come up, when you think about filling up for gasoline, what do you think about? You know, Exxon, it to be Exxon, of course. Well, I wanted Houston Audubon to be presence of mind in terms of birds and bird conservation. And when you think about saving the birds, who do you think about? And I wanted that to be Houston Audubon. Well, you're still doing that. And I encourage you to continue to do that. Just put your focus in that. And, and, Everything you can do to keep up that presence of mind, which we have, and you have, and you've done a great job of, you cannot imagine how important that is. Um, you know, there are a lot of people do a lot of work under the radar, as they say, and they do good work under the radar, and that's fine. But somehow or another, organizations have to be in the radar. <laughs> I mean, they got to have a big presence in the radar. And uh, Houston Audubon needs to keep that presence in the radar, especially now when we're losing so much habitat. We're faced with a catastrophe of global warming. Um, I mean, a huge catastrophe. Uh, we, Houston Audubon's got to be front and center of what we're doing to help birds and, and, and conserve bird habitat in the midst of this catastrophic thing that's going to happen with the warming of the, of the earth. A lot of birds are going to disappear. There's almost nothing we can do about that because of climate change. <clears throat> climate change will drive some birds to extinction and there's not a lot we can do about that. But in the long term, new species will evolve. Um, and as long as we 
are doing our best to conserve habitat, and Houston Audubon is doing its best to conserve habitat. The species that survive will thrive, and new species will evolve. After all, you know, birds survived the great extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs. And if this climate catastrophe, God forbid, wipes us out, birds will probably, they'll still be here. <laughs> um, they'll just be in different species. They'll evolve into different forms, as they did after the great extinction of the dinosaurs. That's not what we want to focus on. We want to focus on what we're doing, number one, to presence of mind. Houston Audubon stands for birds and stands for bird habitat because in doing that, we stand for people. We humans, our, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of birds. And he used to say this when I would do television interviews. You know, the old mine, the, in the old days, the story of the miners going down into the mines with a canary, you know, the canary killed over, they needed to get out of there because methane gas filled up. Well, our birds are canaries, and they're telling us, you know, hey, climate's changing. Something's going wrong. You better do something about it. And understanding that and helping conserve birds helps conserve us, you know, in a way. The conservation of birds is the conservation of our civilization. The conservation of birds in many, many ways is the conservation of human life as we know it. And maybe we should do a better job of making that connection. I didn't, unfortunately, think too much about it that way when I was on the board. I was wrapped up in really conserving habitat for birds and conserving birds, but in the, inter, 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 in the intervening years it's become really apparent to me that the way birds go or the way we will go. By the way, I gave a speech about global warming as Houston Audubon president to a big group of educators uh, that were meeting down in um, I think they were meeting in Princewood, Texas, and they were secondary school educators. And it was a large group, and it was a huge auditorium. I think there were maybe 800 people at least, maybe more, in that audience. And I had been invited to talk about this new thing <laughs> we had known about for a long time called global warming. Um, and so I had, I had been following that, and I knew a fair amount about it, and I had a nice little slideshow about it, and I gave a talk about it to that group, and what was going to happen, the catastrophe that would be looming, and I was booed. I mean, that audience literally booed me. They were educators. These are supposed to be smart people, <laughs> and they booed me. Now, the organizers came up to me later and apologized profusely. I like to find that group right now. <laughs> I'd like to see, not to get an apology from them, but to say, well, what do you think now? Uh, in, in that speech, I talked about our, our lives are connected with lives of birds. When it comes to the global catastrophe, we may face the global warming. Remember, yeah, birds are going to suffer, but we are too. And by thinking about how we conserve birds, how we save birds, we're saving ourselves. That message I did present many, many times, saving birds, we save ourselves. But I think that message is probably urgent, like emergency message right now. Saving birds is saving ourselves because of climate change.